Well, good morning. Man, that was good. You guys are awake and you're ready to go and I'm ready to go. This is sort of the, it's really the official beginning of the, the new series. Last week, we said it was the beginning of the new series, which by the way is called Seven Things to Definitely Do If You Want to Totally Destroy Your Life. And obviously the things we're going to be talking about are things that we don't want to do. Last week, we had the communion, the Lord's Supper together. And so that really wasn't, uh, we didn't jump right in to the list that we're gonna begin today, but we did talk about confession. If there's something that strikes you in your own spirit over the course of the next six weeks, this week and the following six, uh, we talked a little bit about what to do. We don't want to allow anything in our heart and our lives to go if we know that it's standing in our way of a right relationship with Jesus. So today we begin a series and the series, as I told you, is called Seven Things to Totally do or definitely do to totally destroy your life, but it's based on the seven deadly sins. Now, the seven deadly sins isn't found in the Bible. I mean, the themes are found in the Bible, but the seven deadly sins themselves were a list of sins that were originally put together by a group of people called the Desert Fathers. Now, doesn't that sound like something you'd see in an ap apocalyptic movie? You know, to be able to pass across the desert, you have to go and find the fathers. And, you know, these were basically some pre-Catholics uh, who wandered around in the desert and thought deep thoughts and systematized those thoughts. They were professors, they were scholars, they did a lot of writing. And then eventually Pope Gregory the first in 608 or uh, AD organized them and said, these things actually are common to the human experience. And I could not agree anymore. 100% common to the human experience. However, at that point, we differ from Catholic theology because Catholic theology, if you grew up Catholic or familiar with that, they put a lot of weight into these particular sins and their consequences on your soul and the need for confession to a priest and those sorts of things. And we don't. We believe in grace. We believe that sin is all balanced equally in, in as much as it separates us from God the Father. The consequences, however, can be different based on the things that we choose to uh, in, be involved in or the attitudes that we choose to have in our lives. Some personalities are more likely to exhibit certain of these um, sins, these seven deadly sins. There are some personality tests, in fact, that incorporate them into the personality tests. They don't call them sins, but they're tendencies or traits. And some personalities are more uh, prone toward these things. So what are these things? You probably already know these. There was even a movie put out recently that I don't necessarily recommend you watch about the seven deadly sins, but it's a popular theme in our society. Pride, that's what we're talking about today. Envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, and sloth. Um, that's a pretty ominous list of, of things. And, and we're gonna be talking about one each week between now and the next, well, six weeks. Do you know that at the end of this series, it's gonna take us into November? Can you believe that? I mean, six weeks from today, seven, including today. I mean, we're gonna be like done with, um, I don't know, is it okay to say fall and be moving into the winter? I mean, it is insane this year has moved so quickly. Now, what has this year been about for us, for our family here at Capital City Church? In January, we embarked, we started a journey together. The journey together that we started began with a question. And I asked each of you back in January, if you were with us in January, do you wanna be the same person in 12 months that you are right now, spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally? Um, do you wanna be the exact same person or do you wanna change this year? Do you wanna grow? Do you wanna improve? Do you wanna transform? Almost every one of us raised our hand and said, we don't wanna be the same person. We wanna grow. We want to improve. We wanna transform. And the next question I asked you was, what's your plan? Anybody have a plan for growing, for improving, for transforming? Not as many of you raised your hand and that's okay. Challenge accepted. Pastor Dan and myself and our staff and our deacons, we begin to lay out the plan for us as a church family. And we've been following the plan. And I promised you that if you just kept coming, if you just leaned in, if you just participated, that you would put yourself in a place where God will transform you. And you won't even recognize yourself in December when you look back and compare yourself to January. And so whether or not you joined with us last week and are just starting this journey with us or whether you started in January, like many of us did, we are finishing the year well. In the next seven weeks, we're gonna be talking about the seven deadly sins. I wanna ask you to ask yourself a question each week, by the way. 
as we deal with these things, pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, and sloth. I don't want you to ask yourself, is this my wife? Or is this my husband? Or I need to send this to my mom, or I need to send this to my dad, or I wish my kids were here to hear this, or I'm gonna send it to my neighbor because they really need to hear this. I want you to ask yourself the question, is this me? And then let it settle. And then you have to deal with um, something really important, but really hard. Because all of us, well, we usually know why we did what we have done. We usually know our reasons and we usually know, you know, our own background, our context, or we know our own story. So it's very easy for us to make excuses about why we do what we do. And we say, it's because my parents raised me a certain way. It's the church's fault that I grew up in. I didn't have advantages. I had too many advantages. I got left, I got abandoned, I got fired, I got, I mean, we can blame all sorts of things. Now, all of those things are explanations and they're valid explanations, but none of them are excuses because we're all responsible for the choices we make and the people we end up becoming. And so you have to decide as you come to these things, when you ask, is this me? Are you gonna offer God your explanations, which of course is fine if followed by confession, or are you gonna make excuses and say, God, I am the way I am and there's nothing I can do about it. If you wanna take it out on somebody, go find my dad, go find my boss, go find my ex. And there's a diverging trail, a choice you have to make. And the choice, the only reasonable choice that leads toward transformation is the choice of personal responsibility. You own it. So today we're gonna to talk about pride. Pride shows itself in several ways. Pride may be something that you don't necessarily expect. Pride, very simply, is an inflated or unrealistic opinion of yourself. Now, if you think everybody else is arrogant and proud, then you're probably a proud person and you're judgmental. So don't get on your high horse right away and uh, feel like God's given you the gift to point out pride in everyone else because that in and of itself is a tendency that would reveal that there's a lot of lurking pride. Don't say it's for somebody else. Don't say it's for your neighbor. Don't say it's for your parents. Ask God if it's for you. When we see pride in our life, we have to kill it. So our relationship with God and with others can be amazing because without killing pride, without dying to self, then our relationships can never be right. If you were in a city group already and our city groups that are meeting here across the campus are talking about this question to open up their time together today. If I was gonna totally destroy your life with pride, I'd tell you to do these things. If I wanted to tell my son, this is the way you destroy your life with pride, do these things. If I wanted to tell a friend, what would you tell him? How would you tell somebody to let pride shipwreck your life? Pride can be simply a preoccupation with self. It can show itself by sitting around and talking about people, having them for lunch, about all the people and the way they raise their kids and the decisions they make and what they chose to do on the weekend, or can you believe they wore that or they got that or they had that or they said that or they voted that way or they, and we just sit around and we just talk about them and talk about them and talk about them and, and we make ourselves feel better. But at the end of the day, we're just proud people. It can show up in ways that are a little bit more subtle ways. I've already talked to you about the danger of not thinking that it applies to you, but what about the danger of feeling like that? Well, it shows up in three ways. One, it shows up in an elevated view of ourselves that we deserve, that we should, that we have, that, you know, after all, we have it coming to us. An elevated view of ourselves where we view ourselves higher than other people. In Luke chapter 18, we see a story that Jesus told about a Pharisee who that was really describing him. He was a preacher. He was a preacher who went into church and he walked over to the side of the congregation during a prayer meeting where nobody else was and began to speak out loud. And he began to say, thank you, God, that I am not as bad as all those people. Thank you, God, that I'm not a Democrat. Thank you, God, that I'm not a Republican. Thank you, God, that I'm not. I mean, you get my picture, right? Thank you, God, that I'm morally superior to all those people who choose to do things that my grandma told me not to do. Thank you, God, that, I mean, when I was a kid, 
it was like, thank you, God, that I don't walk around with my hair that goes past my ears or thank you, God, that I don't have any tattoos. I mean, because I grew up in a, in a church where if you, you know, I mean, they, they were pretty hung up on that stuff. And so we felt morally superior to people who maybe had external things that, that look like maybe they'd had a background that wasn't as squeaky clean as the background that we were forced into. But maybe with us, it's a little more subtle. We look at the world and we love to complain about the world and how bad the world is because we think we're better. And in reality, a person who's proud judges, but a person who's for encourages. And acknowledging the truth is fine, but dwelling in the negative, well, it elevates us. A person who feels that they should share their opinions with everybody because people just need to know. And it's my job to inform, likely a proud person. Why is your opinion any more important than other people's? Why should everyone have to know what you think? It shows up in very subtle ways. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being informed. Nothing wrong with making yourself the very best self you can be. Nothing wrong with taking care of yourself. Nothing wrong with excelling. Nothing wrong with learning. Those things are really important. But the key is that a proud person is the end and all of those things add to he or she because they are the end and not the means. But if everything we do and all of our accomplishments and all of our effort is a means to a blessing for somebody else, then we put ourselves in the right position with God to where we can be a blessing and we begin to defeat pride. So we don't wanna just let ourselves go. We don't wanna just never accomplish anything. We don't wanna just throw ourselves into this, oh, poor me, because a poor me person who's always obsessing about nobody liking them. And, and I'll give you an example. You ever walk away from a conversation and you just kind of go over and over in your head what you said after you leave? Did anybody ever do that? I do it. Um, no one else, I'm stepping down here to see. Does, am I the only one that does that? I mean, let me explain it to you. When you leave a conversation, you walk away, you get in your car and you go, you idiot, why did you say that? And you go, to, okay, there's some heads that are nodding. All right, I do that all the time. When I speak to audiences, especially ones who I don't know, I mean, I walk away, I beat myself up. I say, man, you've done this for 30 years. You should be better than this. Why did you say that? And I would give you the church answer and say, well, it's just because, you know, I want, you know, the message to be clear. But in reality, I just want them to like me and I want them to invite me back. There's pride in that. We can be so focused on us from a, a negative self-image perspective. Oh, nobody likes me, nobody texts me, nobody reaches out, where our whole life is me, 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 and it's pride. So it reveals itself, it manifests very subtly, it's very, very dangerous. And in Proverbs, we hear about this. We hear the author of Proverbs tell us something that we all know, it's almost a cliche in our human experience, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So the Pharisee demonstrated or showed in Luke chapter 18 that sometimes we just feel like we're more important, like we're better, like we deserve. The second kind of pride and the way that it subtly manifests is that we think, well, we don't need God. That we live our lives practically, I called it practical atheism last week and the week before, we live our lives like we really don't you know, need God. Now, when we need him, we need him and we snap our fingers and we demand that he show up and solve our problems. But in the way we spend our money, the way we spend our time, the way we think, there's very little evidence that God's in his rightful place in our life that we live our lives the way we wanna live our lives and we get what we have coming to us and we demand and we deserve. And we say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian family, we're Christian people. And so God, when I need you, you better be here, pride. Because we're elevating ourselves on the same level or even sometimes above God. This is my business, God, but when I need you, it's your business. And then you have the people, the third kind of level of pride and it's the kind of, level of pride or the third sort of attitude where you say, well, this just doesn't really apply to me. Pastor's talking about somebody else today. If none of this has hit you so far and you feel like you've sort of skirted all of these sort of issues, which I don't know how you, how you possibly could have, because I certainly haven't this week. King David thought that way. We talked about his story last week. The rules didn't apply to him. He could skirt whatever issue he wanted. He could do things his way. 
And because he allowed himself to believe that lie and felt like that he either was above the law or that the law didn't apply to him, he ended up committing a series of sins that begin with a wandering eye that continued with a heart that started to stray and a will that was in conflict against God's, that culminated in an invitation and an affair that resulted in a pregnancy that led to a murder, that led to three years or two years of a broken heart and a wrecked man and consequences that lasted for generations. It applies to us. Sometimes it shows up in really silly ways. Showed up in my life in a silly way this week. My wife, Joy, and I, I like telling you stories about Joy when she's not here. She's down in the other, she's down with the kids this hour. She was here last hour. Uh, they're all true. We were out, we were walking, right? We, were, we do that, we walk. You ever argue with your spouse, anybody? You said you didn't have pride already and you said you never think about, you know, the conversations after you've had them. Do you ever argue when you don't have kids, when your kids have left home, arguing with your spouse is like a sport, it seems like, right? You never get super mad, right? I mean, the cops have never been called to my house. I've never thrown anything that we don't hit each other, but sometimes we, we bicker. Um, I may, sometimes we might, I might pick on her sometimes. I don't mean to, we just do. We spend lots of time together and it's great. We're out walking and we're on this loop and we walk a three mile loop together and we walk as fast as we can. We try to do it for fitness. And we were about halfway through, which means that you can't go back without going the rest of the way. And I said something that might've been insensitive. Now it wasn't terrible, it was insensitive. It got her irritated. And, um, and so uh, instead of me saying, I'm sorry and owning it, I didn't. And uh, I think I said something like, well, you should just grow up, which doesn't work really well in a relationship. And so my wife, she started walking faster because she was mad. And, um, she can walk fast. I mean, she's like, she's got a gift. It's like one of those people that wear the helmet in the Olympics, you know, to walk in the Olympics and her arms started moving. And I'm like, as God, with God as my witness, she is not gonna walk faster than me. I am not letting this woman. And so I'm walking behind her when she wasn't looking, I'm starting to jog because I'm not, and she, and I'm cutting corners behind her, like across the grass and stuff. And I woke up yesterday, this happened on Friday. And I woke up yesterday and I got out of bed and I'm like, Something's wrong. I'm like, oh, I'm not kidding with you. I was sore from trying to keep up with her because there was no way I was letting that woman beat me. I mean, the argument was long gone over. And I told her, I said, not only are you faster than me when you walk, but I mean, I think you taught me an object lesson from my sermon on Sunday. I paid the consequences of stupid pride the entire time when I should have just said, you know what, I'm sorry. Let's walk at a reasonable pace, sweetheart. I wanna pray for you. And we're gonna come back and apply this to our lives in a way that I hope will be meaningful and challenging and that I hope will allow us to grow and be transformed. Um, I, uh, at, the, at the gym a couple of days ago, you know, Ashley Van Horn, she leads worship here and she plays keyboards today. Ashley teaches a class at the gym where I go. And uh, she teaches a water class in the morning on Tuesdays. And so she usually sees me come in because I park sort of in front of the window um, that um, kind of looks out from where she is to the parking lot. And so uh, I didn't have joy with me uh, on Tuesday when I was there. And so Ashley asked me a little bit later, she goes, what were you doing when you parked your Jeep? So you were being weird in the parking lot. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, you kept walking around the car and I thought you were gonna open the door for joy and she wasn't with you. And you know, what happened was, you know, I'm trying to park in the lines and there's some lines that are painted on the parking lot. And you're supposed to, by the way, park in those lines. And the two cars next to me, they weren't parked in the lines at all. They were parked over the lines and they were parked at opposite angles, like, like across the line. And, but I'm still trying to make sure that I'm oriented correctly in between the lines. And so I told her, I said, Ashley, I'm just, I was trying to make sure that I was where I needed to be because I couldn't trust the two cars that were around me because they weren't parked the right way. Now there is truth. And the truth is found in the lines that have been laid out before us. The lines that have been laid out before us are the lines that we find in scripture. And a lot of times we can't trust what we see around us. Sometimes even the people who are around us, and it's not because they intend to deceive us, but because we're all learners and we're all on a journey together. So we're gonna look at God's word and we're gonna do it pretty quickly. And this sermon, the second half will be a lot shorter. You'll be happy to know than the first service because we had the video and this great baptism this morning, but you're gonna have to put on your running shoes and buckle up or put on your running shoes and get ready to run, I guess, because we're gonna move fast. I'm taking you all the way back to our origin 
story to the book of Genesis, to the beginning of the book of Genesis. If you're not a Christian or you're new to church, this may be a story that you're sort of familiar with, but you don't really understand. I encourage you to read it. If you're a Christian or you've been around church for a while, you know the story, but let's rethink through this story in a way that might be a little bit different. All the way back to Genesis chapter three, the time that pride infected the world. And that infection is still running rampant in us today. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit trees of the, or any of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Does the story sound familiar to most of you? Okay, again, if it doesn't, I encourage you to read it yourself. And if you don't have a Bible, you can download an app that's called the NIV, NIV Bible for free through the app store or biblegateway.com. We'll give you 50 different translations of the Bible. We use the NIV in teaching. I encourage you to read this for yourself. It's also in your notes on the PDF on your app. Um, in verse four, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now there's some players, some characters in this this story. And this is a story that we Christians believe is absolutely true that literally happened as God spoke the world into existence. And you read about that in Genesis 1, created the first human, which was Adam. And you can read about that again at the very beginning of Genesis, the very first woman, we'll talk about that in just a second, who was Eve, the very first temptation, the very first sin. It was the first of everything. And it set um, the background, the conflict, for the rising action of the story of humanity until the time of Jesus. This is where it all began. Well, the fruit tree was at the center of the garden. Now, the reason I believe that God had one tree with fruit and, and the tree was called the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, that's a mouthful, but what it represented was the one thing that God had asked Adam and Eve not to touch. Now, in, in philosophical study, they call this in theological study, the problem of praiseworthiness. And it's a big sort of a convoluted kind of an idea, but I believe this is why God did it. Not because he's an egomaniac, not because he loves rules, but because if you were created perfect and sinless and there was no opportunity for you to sin at all, there was no way for you to choose anything except obedience to Christ, then how is that worship? If you're created in a way where you can only do one thing and you do that thing, it's not worship. But if you're created in a way, in an environment, in a setting where you have options and you choose to do the right thing, that's worship. Does that track in with you guys? Are you computing? So, so there was a tree in the middle of the garden and Eve began to focus on that one thing that God said, don't do. Instead of looking at all of the things that God said are for you and the plot, unfortunately, well, it thickens. In Genesis 2, we see that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to care for it. I backed up one chapter. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. And Adam didn't know what death was. He didn't know what work was. He didn't know what anything was. He was the new guy. Nobody had gone before him. All of this was brand new. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is suitable for him. And so the Bible tells us, and you can read this on your own, that God created Eve out of the rib or from the rib of Adam while Adam was asleep and he woke up and there she was. What an amazing gift. Not because Eve was of lesser value or because she was lesser in character, but because God made her as a perfect complement 
to where the two together could serve the Lord in a way that the one alone could never serve the Lord. Does that make sense? God gave the perfect partner for the perfect partnership, not an employee, a partner. And so you have Adam and Eve here in the garden, and it was an amazing partnership. Now we have Satan, the serpent, who came on the scene. And many times we think of him as a slithery snake, but the word serpent literally means dragon. And he was probably very attractive. Now, Satan was cast from heaven for the sin pride. And even though it had happened chronologically before the garden, we don't read about it until later, until Isaiah and Ezekiel, later in the Old Testament. Satan was probably taking the form of a dragon. He could talk. Maybe that was unusual for the animals. Maybe all the animals in the garden could talk. I don't know. But what he had to say was not worth listening to. Satan then, just like now, is the deceiver, fell from heaven, cast from heaven because of pride. He wanted to be like God and worship like God. When in reality, his job was to be the worship leader, to point toward God. And at some point he said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not pointing toward him anymore. We're together. I may even be better. Who knows? So he was cast from heaven. A few angels, a bunch of angels went with him. We call them demons. And Satan entered the picture early in our origin story here in the form of a serpent. And he began to, to, well, his strategy, lies and deception to Eve. Why would God tell you not to do something? Very suspicious. What might lie on the other end of what you're not allowed to touch? What if it's better? What if it's more? And Eve started to think, if I take it, I could be an influencer. I can be popular. I can know everything. God's threatened by me. And her mind and her ego went wild. And I don't know why, but it did. It was the very first time that there had been any lies. The very first deception. The very first distortion of of God's word. Satan said, listen, you have the right to question God. You have the right to doubt God. You have the right to distrust God. You see how these are building in intensity. You have a right to disobey God. You can do whatever you want with your time, with your money, with your thoughts. You can live whatever way you want to. You should take it all and then demand that God be there for you when you get in trouble. You can be just like him. Or maybe he even he'll work for you. And Eve began to ponder, she began to think. And I wish there was somebody there that could talk good sense into her. I probably would have done the same thing. I'm not judging, I'm just saying. This is the most tense, the most crucial, the most important moment in, well, the one that we will ever have known until Jesus arrived on on the scene. Let's keep moving because we're running short on time. It was the sin of pride. Pride crowds other people out. Pride, it crowds God out. Pride's a prison. And when you say no to pride, you say yes to God. The question is, why would you opt to follow something that's killing you when you've been invited to follow someone who died for you? Now, Eve chose poorly, and we're gonna come back to that in a minute. Interestingly enough, you read that when... God gave the instructions to Adam in the first place. Eve hadn't even been created yet. You can read it, you really should. Eve was still an idea yet to be created when God gave Adam the instructions on the tree. So who gave Eve the instructions on the tree? Probably Adam. So when Eve began to doubt God, perhaps she began to doubt Adam. Maybe she said, my husband doesn't want the best for me. Maybe he's keeping the good fruit to himself. Who knows what was going through her mind, but pride was beginning to creep in and eat away at her. And as she chose to eat the fruit, Adam followed right along. There was a curse placed on humanity, a garden, an angel set at the edge of the garden and events were set in motion that ultimately led to Jesus. So we fast forward all the way to Jesus and one of the last events of his life. Now I'm skipping some stuff here, but it's really important. Jesus gets to the end of his life on earth, gathers his friends together, and they have a dinner together. And he's given his final instructions to them. And pride has been their nemesis, their Achilles heel. Jesus' best friends all along 
Who's going to be the best? Who's going to get to sit in the place of honor? Who's going to get closest to Jesus? Who's going to get the best food? I mean, they were like siblings scrambling over whatever they thought they had coming. And so Jesus is leaving them with an object lesson here at one of the last moments they were together. And they all gather together to eat and they all recline at the table. And instead of reclining with them, even though the Bible says, as you can see behind me and read in your notes, that Jesus was, was God and was coming back to God and deserved to be worshiped, he took a basin and some water and he washed the disciples' feet. And after he washed their feet, showing humility, showing that his life, as great as it was, was given not just for him to enjoy, but to give to other people, to serve other people. He challenged them and he said, you go and you do exactly like I have done. But he wasn't washing good people's feet. Jesus was washing the feet of a group of deniers, a group of cowards, of deserters, of people who couldn't get out of their own way, of a person who would be a traitor and sell him to the Romans for just a few bucks. And he said, listen, if you really wanna beat it, if you really wanna die to yourself, if you really wanna be like me, he asked some questions. I've listed a couple of them for you in my own words. You can make up yours if you want. What if you don't always have to be first and win? What if it's not all about making sure your needs are met, you're taken care of, you got what you want, that you're happy? What if it's not all about that? What if you don't have to win every single time? What would it be like to lose? what would it be like to let somebody else go first? But we live in a world that's so full of competition. Is there anything wrong with competition? Not being your best self, not learning as much as you can and taking good care of your body, about improving, about growing. That's all godly. As long as you're not the end, as long as you're the means And the people, the world around you is the end that can receive the blessing as God uses you and your best self. So you don't always have to win. What would it be like just to back up and let somebody else go first? What would it be like not to go at all? And Jesus left the disciples with with this example. Now I wanna take you back as we close. Back to the garden. They seem subtle, these two words, but they're very important. I want you to pay close attention to two things. One, when the words Lord God are used together and when the words God are used alone or the word God is used alone. Very important. In Genesis, when Moses, who authored Genesis under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so God wrote it through the pen of Moses. When he referred to God, he said the Lord God. God is God in charge, our deity, Lord in charge of us, it's personal, we follow. Lord, we're a follower, God is no matter what. Does that make sense? Lord's the personal connection, God is the universal reality. And so for us, those of us who are Christians, we would say Jesus is our Lord and not just God, he's both. Now, as we read this together, the Bible says, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that who? The Lord God made. That's what you're supposed to say. He said to the woman, now this is the serpent talking. He said to the woman, did God really say? He gave God a nickname. Instead of it being the Lord God, the one you follow, the one whose life you've given yourself to, the one whose will you've submitted to, he's now calling him the big guy, the man upstairs, the kindly grandfather who's a little out of touch with reality, but may have your best interest at heart. He's made God something other than who God really is. And he does it very subtly by just nicknaming God. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, and look how it was contagious. She caught it. We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, seems subtle to you. But it's so important because everywhere else, all throughout this story, Lord God was used. And Eve had decided that God was no longer Lord. 
One of the things I do when I study to, to preach is um, I read commentaries and, you know, I study the traditional way, but I also love to listen. I listen to sermons. I do it a lot of times when I out walk in. Joy and I sometimes listen together, but I listen to other pastors who preach on the same subjects that I'm preaching on. And one of the reasons is because I don't have a pastor. Now we have a staff, a pastoral staff, and we take good care of each other and we pray together and for each other, but I don't have a teacher. Um, I teach, you know, on Sundays. And so I listen to other pastors and, and I'm taught by them. And I was listening to a pastor earlier this week preaching on this subject. And he said when he was in seminary, when he was going through his training, somebody gave him a book. And the book was basically about how to make sure you keep the word Lord in Lord God. Now, I didn't say it like that, but for our purposes, that's what it means. How do you make sure you keep the word Lord in your life and not just dumb it down to where it's just God? Because just God is I'll do what I want with what's mine and you better be there. Lord God is, I'll do what you want with my life, Father, because it's all yours. You follow what I'm saying? And so in this book, it said, listen, it said, you can know that as long as you are on the throne in your life, that you're calling the shots, that you're in control, Jesus is on the cross. But when you decide to get off the throne in your own life and die to self, then Jesus is on the throne in your life and you're on the cross. Because on the cross represents dying to self, being willing to live for the Lord God. But we have to choose. And it's so hard. I've had a head start this week. And what I found is that prayer reveals truth in my life. You may have already been convicted of something as we've talked through these things. And I hope you have, because that's what God's word is good for. Do you know a child is the only person who looks in the mirror and walks away without adjusting anything? You ever have looked in a mirror and gone, hey, it's perfect. Never, right? I look in the mirror and go, I'm getting older. I'm wrinkled. I got a nose hair. I mean, there's always something, right? Only a child looks into the mirror and goes, ha, ha, and walks away. The word of God is a mirror for us. So we stare into it, not to make sure we're still here, but so that we can change and be like Jesus. We can transform. So I encourage you this week to do what I have been doing already, only because I went first, not because I'm better, is to pray and ask God to reveal in your life where pride has taken control and ask him to ruthlessly eliminate it from your life. And if you ask it every day, I guarantee you, you'll begin to think about things a different way. Father, thank you for my friends. And I just pray that as we close, that you would allow this message to sink in, not because I did a great job delivering it. I did the best I could. But that's certainly not good enough for something as important as this. But because you mention it over and over and over again, both in the Old Testament and the New, it's important to you. You tell us in your word that you resist the proud, that you turn your face away from the proud, but that you enable, that you lift up those who are humble. And I pray, Father, that, that we wouldn't think less of ourselves, but that we would just think about ourselves a little less often. That we would continue to become the best version of ourselves with balance, but not because we're an end, but because we wanna be a means. That we give our life to you, everything we have, for you to use for the benefit of the world around us. Kill this pride that has made such a comfortable home in so many of our hearts. I pray it with confidence and in Jesus' name, amen.